Bible is a wonderful book. It is, it's a staggering book. Halley's Bible Handbook has about three pages of quotations from founding fathers of our country, some English statesmen, and so forth, talking about the Bible. And when you sit down and read speeches and letters and, and documents from the founding fathers of this country and, and the history, really, of the English-speaking world, the Bible just keeps coming up. It's mentioned in their speeches. It's mentioned as the guiding you know, light in their lives. That they, It is so obvious that these men, while they were human, while they had problems, while they made mistakes, their conscience, they had one. It was informed by this book. And it's really striking to realize just how true that is and how important that is in the history of the world. I had reason just recently to, to once again be kind of overwhelmed by the Bible and its power. I got a letter from a prison chaplain down in southwest Texas. And I, I, part of the letter was, was not entirely, well, it was, it was, again, it was overwhelming, but he sent along a, a, a handmade leather uh, checkbook holder that was made by a life, you know, life sentence inmate in the prison where he was there. had my name on it, had the Born to Win radio program, you know, a little, little micro, silver microphone on it. Great deal of detail, a handsome piece of work. He said this guy, when he came into prison down there, was a real hard case. He was a real troublemaker all the way, and his life had been turned completely around by my program and by the tapes and the stuff that he got from me. And that was really, really uh, thought-provoking. But what was really humbling, and, you, and I'll have to explain what I mean by this, he told me of a Vietnamese lady in the community there that he had begun to share my tapes with. And he said this woman, who was Buddhist, had converted from Buddhism to Christianity on the basis of re here listening to my tapes and listening, reading this book. The reason I say it, it, it's, it, in a way it's gratifying, but in another way it's very humbling, because I know categorically that if I had sat down and tried to think, now how would I organize a set of lessons, how would I create a set of broadcasts or tapes or what have you, to be able to convert someone from Buddhism to Christianity, I would have been at a complete loss and probably would have been a complete failure. The reason why this woman's life was turned around was because of the Bible. The Bible is a book of such incredible power that it is a power to change men's lives that I don't think we really appreciate it sometimes. For us, it has become a, it's an old familiar fixture for me. You know, this thing has been with me. I have two of them like this, and, and both of them have been with me now. I say, well, no, sorry, the oldest of them has been with me for nearly 40 years. The other one, I think I got about uh, 15 years into that cycle because I wore the first one out and had to send it off to the uh, binders to be rebound, and then when I got it back, then after a while I had to send the first one off and wore it out. But the, this, you know, this book in this shape and this form has been with me for not now to 40 years, and, of course, the Bible was with me uh, much longer than that. Because I don't remember a time in my life when I did not know about the Bible, when I didn't believe in the Bible, when I did not have an awareness of God and of Jesus Christ. In my case, a lot of it was from the singing of my father, who was a, a bass singer in a gospel quartet. So I always, all my life, have known about God. And I can't remember the first time either that I sang the little song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, for the Bible tells me so, which all, a lot of us learn when we were children. Is the Bible hard to understand? You know, to be honest, yes, it is. At a certain level, the Bible is definitely a book that is hard to understand. There are parts of the Bible that do not make good reading at all. All the begets and begats and genealogies and stuff. There are places in the Bible, you know, a lot of people start out to read the Bible and they get all the way. This is the most common place, I think, when people stop reading the Bible is the sixth chapter of Leviticus or thereabouts. Somewhere in there, when they get into all of the details of the sacrificial system, their eyes close, they nod off to sleep, and then they just don't somehow get back to them. A lot of the laws that they find in the Bible do not make sense at all in the modern world. I mean, you look at them, and you say, oh, give me a break. There's, no, there's nothing here that a person should try to do in the 20th century. I, I, can't, I can remember a fellow who once learned about the scripture that said that you shall not mix fabrics like linen and woolen together went home and cut the elastic out of the top of all of his socks and made himself look even more disheveled than he had in the first place because he didn't feel that the, you know, there should be any mixed fabrics on his body at all. So there are parts that don't make much sense. But there is something else about the Bible. 
The Bible is a book that rewards perseverance. That if you persevere, if you continue, if you press, it will reward you. And that a lot of times when you come up against something that is the hardest things to understand, will, if you persevere, it may take a year, it may take two years, and in some few cases it may take your lifetime. But those things that sometimes are the hardest for you to come to grips with will ultimately mean the most to you in your life. They will be the things that will sometimes be the most life-changing things you will ever find in the book. The Bible, the Bible is about life. And life is complicated. And life is difficult, isn't it? Well, then it should be no surprise if the Bible turns out to be complicated and difficult. We don't even know how difficult life is going to become. Because with the, every advancement in science... And this, this last year has been incredible, and the year to come will be even more so. The ethical issues that are going to be raised for people to deal with are enough to make a man stagger. The burdens that are going to fall on the shoulders of people in our generation to decide, is this right? Is this wrong? You know, can I do this? Is this a wrong thing to do, and where will this lead? The questions are enormous. And for the most part, in our modern world, people are without a guide. And they don't even have a basis, you know, from which they can synthesize a new set of ethics. Now, I don't know if you know what I mean by that, but the truth is that all the time, the Bible doesn't give us all the answers. What it does is give us the basis for the answers. And we take many things that are in the Bible, and we work with them, and work with them, and we use them, and we synthesize decisions out of them. In other words, if you know if this, you know, if you draw, just by analogy, if you draw a set of li- dots along a line, uh, on a graph, you can, you can pretty well connect them up at the top and connect them up at the bottom. If they're all a straight line, you can predict what's going to be in the middle. And so this is the way we live our lives. We, we know certain things to be true. And then we conclude certain things about what sits between these based upon it. It's, a, it's an extrapolation, interpolation. These are the words we use all the time. And we synthesize answers to ethical questions. But the problem many people in the modern world are facing is they don't have anything from which to, to, to um, extrapolate. They have nothing to work with in the first place. They don't have a sound basis for an ethical structure, and therefore it can be almost anything that they want it to be. And the results of that are terrifying in a world that has the scientific capabilities that we've got today. Now here is what Paul, in the last letter of his life, had to say to Timothy about this book. He said to Timothy, chapter, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, Continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of. Chapter 3, verse 14 of 2 Timothy. Continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them, and that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And righteousness is a kind of a high-flown religious word, but basically what he means by this is for instruction in the difference between right and wrong. So you can know what's right as opposed to what is wrong. So that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, if you think about the Bible as you read it, it should occur to you that when Timothy was a child, there was no New Testament, right? When Timothy was a child, not one word of the New Testament had been written. Even when this particular letter is written, probably half the New Testament, well, no, less than half of it, but certainly not all the New Testament had even yet been written. So you need to understand this. When he he says the Holy Scriptures to Timothy, he's not talking about the New Testament. He is talking about the first part of this book, which you and I call the Old Testament. Now let's read the passage again with that simple fact in mind. From a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation, which is in Christ Jesus. What Scriptures? Old Testament. No way of getting around it. All Scripture, what Scripture? The Old Testament. Can't be anything else. 
is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, which is what doctrine means, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in the difference between right and wrong. Now, that's a very interesting statement. Now, the Old Testament, according to this, is able to make a man wise unto salvation. It's also profitable for correction, doctrine, reproof, and so forth. But back in 2 Timothy verse, chapter 2, verse 15, he makes this short statement, which some people stumble over. He says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I don't know how many times I've heard this in my life applied. It's a very common application made by some, some students. They say, rightly dividing the word of truth means separating between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that the Old Testament, we don't have to observe that anymore. The New Testament is what we have to pay attention to. So rightly dividing the word of truth is dividing it into the Old Testament and the New Testament. Question. How is Timothy supposed to do that? You know, what's Timothy supposed to divide? Because, as I say, from the time he was a child, and what Paul is talking about by the Holy Scriptures is the Old Testament. The New Testament, per se, it's very doubtful that anybody had, had even presumed to call it Scripture yet, although we would certainly come to see it that later on. But by this time, so when he says rightly dividing the word of truth, he can't possibly be talking about the difference between Old Testament and New Testament. And uh, there's a gentleman I used to know, you know who compared the Old Testament to... Uh, to the a map that goes from Texas to California. His conclusion was, when you get to California, you don't need the Old Testament anymore, the, the road map anymore. Don't throw it away, he said. I do. He just said, you don't throw it away, but you don't need it anymore. Now, you have to remember, though, that this is precisely the same letter, just a few verses down, where Paul said, from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, able to make you wise unto salvation. And he definitely is talking about the Old Testament. So how could he possibly be talking about dividing Old and New Testament and throwing away the Old when he is going to say categorically that the Old Testament is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and instruction in the difference between right and wrong? Sorry, as we say down here in Texas, that old dog won't hunt. However, rightly dividing, and the Greek word for that means, doesn't, doesn't, rightly dividing is not very good. What it means is cutting straight. It means make a straight cut as opposed to a crooked cut. If Paul was using the vernacular today, he'd probably use the expression straight shooter, because that's the idea he's talking about. What he means is dealing honestly with the word of truth, and if my memory serves, that's the way the NIV translates it. Now, I want to take you to one important Old Testament passage that may shed some light on this. It is the longest of the Psalms in the Old Testament. The psalm is divided into stanzas according to the Hebrew alphabet. And the very first stanza in this psalm, it's 119th, in case you haven't already figured that out. The 119th psalm. The very first stanza in this this chapter, which is about the law of God, has no less than, in fact, it has exactly seven synonyms for the law of God. Seven. I didn't make it seven. In fact, I underlined them all and then went back to count them, wondering if it was seven. And sure enough, it was. It begins in verse 1. Count them as I go along, if you like. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. One. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. Testimonies is a synonym for the law of God. I think probably everybody here has heard of the Ark of the the Covenant, right? Have you ever heard of the Ark of the Testament? Because, in fact, that was the original name of the Ark of the Covenant, was the Ark of the Testament. You don't find it called until much later, the Ark of the Covenant. A little concordance search will show that to you. Why was it called the Ark of the Testament? Because it contained the testimony of God. What was the testimony of God? Ten Commandments on two tables of stone. So the testimonies are the Ten Commandments. Those that seek Him with a whole heart, they do no iniquity, they walk in His ways. You have commanded us to keep your, by the way, his ways is another synonym for law. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were were directed to keep your statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I have learned your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. 
Here they are. The ways of God, the law of God, testimonies, precepts, statutes, commandments, judgments. Just about every angle you can come at to try to establish the concept of the law of God. And in fact, in this section, there is one more. It's not mentioned in this particular passage, but thy word is actually used as a synonym for law. Now, here is my question for you this afternoon as we tackle this particular line of thought. What is the objective of the law? Why was it given? What is it supposed to accomplish? There are those, by the way, who look at the, at the old law, the Old Testament, as a yoke of bondage to be thrown off. The law to them is shackles and chains. But in this psalm, as in no place else in the Bible, it sets forth the objectives of the law in terms that anyone, I think, should be able to understand. And if you don't understand what something is all about, you don't understand the objective, you're going to have a hard time dealing with it and grappling with it. So, what's the law for? Why, and this is an important question to anyone who believes that the law of God was abolished at some point, or any part of the law of God was abolished. What was it originally given for? This psalm answers the question. The first objective of the law is found in verse 6. We already read it. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all your commandments. The objective of the law is to keep us from having to be ashamed. And every one of us knows what shame feels like, and it is hateful. I can't think of very many emotions I have felt in my life that I less want to repeat than shame. Next in verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to your word. The objective of the law is to enable a young man to clean up his act. Okay, note this well. It is the young man in this case who is the actor. It isn't somebody else that cleans up his life. It isn't the law that cleans up his life. He is the actor who cleanses his way. But he does it by paying attention to the law. The law is the enabler. The law is the educator. The law is the teacher that shows him the right way to go. But he still has to do it. Careful study of the law gives a young man the tools he needs to turn his life around. So the objective of the law is to enable a young man, or an old man for that matter, to clean up his life. In order to do right, you have to know right. Right? I mean, I don't know how you can get around that. In order, if you're going to do right, you've got to know what right is. And all of us, of course, want to do right. The law helps us to know right. Then he continues in verse 10 to say, With my whole heart have I sought you. Don't let me wander from your commandments. Your word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Now, are you ready for a surprise on this? I think there are many people, there's a theology of it that says that the law was given so that there would be sin. In other words, that sin, the law was given so there would be sin, so that then we would be able to be repent and be converted, or you know, that we would need Christ and salvation. All right? I have a surprise for you. The psalmist tells us that the objective of the law is to prevent sin. Didn't you just read it? Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. The law wasn't given to create sin. It was given to prevent sin. Why you want to prevent sin? Well, because sin's destructive. Sin is that category of, of, of activities, thoughts, uh, actions that destroy our lives that hurt us, that hurt our loved ones, that hurt our neighbors and hurt people close to us, and that wreck a community. That's what sin's all about. And the law is here to prevent that, to stand between us and sin, to say, don't do that, that's harmful. Don't do that, that's harmful. Don't do this, this is destructive. Otherwise, how would we know? Well, some of them we can learn the hard way. You know, you 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 can go about these things, learning them all by experience if you must, but that's pretty painful. And it's sometimes more more expensive than we can afford because it costs us our life. It's just a whole lot better not to have to go that way. Next, he says in verse 17, a little later, Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I am a stranger in the earth. Oh, don't hide your commandments from me. Do you get the significance of this? You know, when you go to a a foreign country 
You wander in there not knowing the language, not knowing anybody, not knowing your way around, not knowing anything about the country. I mean, it's devastating to be in that situation. It's kind of lonesome, isn't it? I don't know if you've ever been there or not, but trust me, it's very lonesome. So he says, look, I am a stranger in the earth. Don't hide your commandments from me. Why? Because the commandments are going to show me the way around. It's like a guide. You know, it's like having somebody at your elbow say, don't go over there. Don't walk down this street after dark. Catch the, you know, this subway over here and take this one because it's safe over this direction. You, it's, it's like a guide to life. Don't hide them. I'm a stranger here. In other words, it's a, it's a guide to you and a help when you're in a place you don't understand. And who, do, who is it that wouldn't from time to time say, I sure don't understand the world I'm living in. Now, if you really think the law has been abolished, sit down and write yourself a letter to this man and explain to him where he missed the point. Because if you say the law of God has been abolished to a man who says, oh, please don't hide your commandments from me because I need them, he's not going to understand what you're talking about. And if you come to understand that the law of God was given because we needed them, then why on earth would God do away with something that man needed? Unless God changed or man changed, you know, because the purpose of the law is, again, not to direct our lives, but to open our eyes. He goes on to say, verse 20, My soul breaks for the longing it has to your judgments at all times. You have rebuked the proud that are cursed, who err from your commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, because I have kept your testimonies. The objective of the law is to spare us from reproach and contempt. Nobody wants people holding you in reproach. Nobody wants to be the song of drunkards. No one wants people telling jokes about you on Jay Leno at night, do they? That's a terrible thing to have that kind of reproach and contempt toward you. Well, he says, give me your testimonies. Let me know your way, because I can be spared the reproach and the contempt of people like this. Princes, he said, did sit and speak against me. But I meditated on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight and my counselors. The objective of the law is to counsel and advise. How many times a week do you feel the need for advice? When there are decisions to be made, shall I go here, shall I go there? And whenever you find you know, some of the troubling ethical questions that face us these days. It's not so easy. You know, you, you need some sort of a basis, or some sort of a framework into which you can fit life's decisions. He basically is saying that the, that the testimonies of God are a framework into which his decisions can be fit and which can then advise him about future decisions. They lay out a pattern for him. In verse 41, passing further down, let your mercies come also unto me, O God, O Lord, even your salvation according to your word. So I'll have something to answer him that reproaches me, because I trust your word. Notice, the ability, the objective of the law is to give you an answer when you are reproached. Don't take your word utterly out of my mouth. I have hoped in your judgments. I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty because... I seek your precepts. There is a powerful cause-effect relationship laid out for us right here. The objective of the law is to give us liberty. It isn't to put shackles around our ankles. It isn't to chain us to the wall. It isn't to keep us from pleasure and having a wonderful time in life. It isn't like we, you know, we're not in a position of the teenager who says to his dad, Oh, Dad, you never want me to have any fun. And there are people who look at the law of God and assume that God in heaven is like a stern father, and we're the teenager who says, you don't ever want me to have any fun. But the fact of the matter is, you break the law, you're going to jail. You let steal money from somebody else. You burglar somebody else's house, you're going to jail. If you have an ethical and moral framework to do what is right, it is crucial to the maintaining of your liberty, your freedom, your ability to walk the streets out here as a free person, your ability to go to dinner tonight wherever you'd like to go and not be, 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 have to check in with somebody before you can do it. All the liberties that we share in this world are because we have a moral structure in our lives. Lou, take away that moral structure, and you may become one of the very rapidly growing prison population in the state of Texas. 
The objective of the law is not to put us in chains and shackles. It is to give us liberty. You know, one of the funniest arguments I heard recently, I know it wasn't that recently, several months ago, but we were on the Internet forum talking about different things, and somebody decided to opine that the Sabbath day, as presented in the Fourth Commandment in the Bible, was a yoke of bondage. I laughed my head off. I really did. I laughed my head off. And here, here are a group of people standing around the foot of Mount Sinai who were born in slavery, who all their lifetime had to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Whenever they could see to work in the morning, they had to go to work. And when they couldn't see anymore at night, they were allowed to go home and go to bed. Here were a people who knew nothing in their life but work. And God comes along and says, take a day off. And they call it a yoke of bondage. I mean, really, folks, we've some, sometimes a sense of humor is one of your best defenses against some of this stupidity. Because if you understand the Sabbath at all, of all the laws of God, it is simply not equipped to be a yoke of bondage because the Sabbath is the day you take the yoke off. How hard can this be? Continuing in verse 65, further down. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed your commandments. The objective of the law is knowledge and good judgment. What's good judgment worth to you? You know, you, you live, you've lived long enough in your life, most of you have, have to really know people who have bad judgment, haven't we? And we have seen how that poor judgment, either poor in the choice of the companions they run around with, poor judgment in the, in the choice of the man some woman decides to marry, poor judgment in the job they decide to take, poor judgment in, no, you just go on and name it. You've probably got people in your own family who, you know, if you ever wanted to know what the right thing to do is, figure out what they're going to do and do the opposite. You know, good judgment. What's, what's, what is good judgment worth? Well, where does it come from? You know, I have known in my lifetime, been blessed to know, a strong collection of people, and not everybody I know, but a good strong collection of people who have sound judgment, that whenever they come to a conclusion about something, you can count on it because... They're not coming off the top of their head. They're not responding on impulse. They aren't trusting in their own self-righteousness. They have a good sound basis, and they know when to speak and when to shut up. They all that, which is one of the most important aspects of judgment, by the way. So that when they say, this is true, you can take it to the bank. That kind of judgment, I, I just don't know how to evaluate it. I don't know, what, you know how to put a value on it. It is so powerful. Well, what's it worth to you? What would it, what, if I could rewire you to give you good, sound judgment in all the life's problems, what's it worth? You know, what do you lay on the line for it? I can't do that, of course, because there is no easy path to good judgment. But there is a path. Follow me? There is no easy path to good judgment, but there is a path. It is the Bible and specifically the law in this context. But under all, it is the entirety of the book that you hold there. This is the way to judgment. If you can get your kids to internalize the law of God while they're children, you will have given them a basis of good, sound judgment for life from which they can synthesize solutions to some of the naughty problems they're going to have to face in the future, to know which way to go, right or left, on some things that are going to affect the lives, not only their own lives, or perhaps the lives of any number of other people. Good, sound judgment. You want that for your kids? There is a path. But it's not an easy path. And it's not automatic by any stretch of the, of, of the way. It doesn't mean that when you've given your kids that path that they won't make mistakes. It does mean, though, that they will recognize them as mistakes when they make it. And that is incredibly invaluable all by itself. Because I don't know how many people in my lifetime I have watched make silly, stupid mistakes and then do them again because they never figured out the first time that it was a mistake. It is proverbial that women who marry abusive husbands, when they get rid of them and get shed of them, are going to do it again. It's just all too common. They do it because this kind of guy, I guess, meets some kind of need in their life, but they don't have the good judgment, having made the mistake, to recognize it as a mistake and not make it again. Kids will make mistakes. You've got to give them room for that. You've got to give them a chance to make their errors and learn from their mistakes, but you've also got to give them the foundation for evaluating the mistakes 
and for developing the judgment that comes from experience. He goes on to say in verse 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I've kept your word. You know, I've had a lot of occasions in my life to think about that verse. Because by the time you get to be 66 years old, as some of you may know, uh, there have been plenty of opportunities to be afflicted in life. And Hebrews talks about, in the 12th chapter, about don't despise the chastening of the Lord, for whom he loves, he chastens. One thing I have had to learn is that the afflictions, the chastisement, and it's always hard to know, you know, if something happens to you, did it happen for bad luck, or was it God himself giving you a little, you know, chastisement to bring you around? And in one sense, the word doesn't matter. If you treat affliction like chastisement all the time to learn your lessons from it, you can't go very far wrong. And he says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept your word. I can't tell you the number of times in my life when I have been afflicted, and as a result of that affliction have learned lessons from them, have been able to connect them to the Bible, have been able to tie them up with other things that I know, and grow in judgment as a result of those things that I went through. It's precious to me. I wouldn't give it up for anything. And, of course, that's one of the things this fellow is trying to tell us in the song. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. I had to have somebody get my attention first. You are good, and you do good. Teach me your statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. You know, there is a funny thing about this, that the harder you try to do right, the more likely you are to encounter people who are going to lie about you. You know why that is? Because in the process of doing right, you make people uncomfortable. You don't have to say a word. But the choice of doing right when no one else wants to is in itself a condemnation of their actions, and they have got to find a way to live with it. And the result? Usually it's lies. He says, Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver. Your hands, verse 73, your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding. I want understanding so I can learn your commandments. They that fear you will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in your word. Now I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right and that you in faithfulness have afflicted me. Get that. He says, I know that you have been faithful when you have afflicted me. What does this mean? It means you weren't crude in it. It means you weren't just trying to hurt me. It means that everything you have done for me or to me has been for my own good. It has been faithful. This lesson, this is what I mean by the importance of teaching your children the law. Because it will be more likely then that they will recognize the hand of God in their life, and they will understand their failures, and they will understand affliction better, and know what to do with it when it comes along. Verse 89. Forever, O Lord, your word, it's sent an M for law, but just take it as your word, your word is settled in the heaven. Your faithfulness is unto all generations. You have established the earth. And it abides. You know what it means when he says your faithfulness abides to all generations? He means I can trust you now and forevermore. Through any generation of people upon this earth, I and they can trust you because you are consistent. It means that God doesn't make mistakes that he later has to correct. Now, if the law of God is the testimony of God, God doesn't lie. The law of God is the truth. It's his word. Why would he change it? If he's faithful, if he's constant, why on earth would he rumble ten words down from the top of Mount Sinai, only planning to change them in a couple of thousand years? Why? There is no reason. Because his testimonies are right in the first place. He doesn't give them, only later on to take them back away. He says then again, they continue, verse 91, they continue this day according to your ordinances for all of your servants. Unless your law had been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. Notice, the objective of the law is 
Survival. Survival. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, have made me wiser than my enemies because your commandments are always with me. The objective of the law is wisdom. I mean, how much have we got to see in here of what the objective of the law is before we begin to grasp what he's driving at? I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. Why? I mean, I have more understanding than my teachers. Why? Because your testimonies are my meditation. What does that mean? It means I sit around thinking about them. I think about them. I try to apply these things to the life situations I face. And as a result of it, I understand what's coming down, and the people who are up here trying to teach me don't know. Fascinating. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. The objective of the law is understanding. I have refrained my feet from every evil way to keep your word. I have not departed from your judgments, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste! Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, and I hate every false way. Why? Because it hurts. Because it's wrong. Because it won't work for us. Then he says something truly profound. He says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And this may be the most important objective summary of the objective of the law. Think about it. So many people think of the law as shackles and chains, a yoke of bondage, something to keep us from having any fun, keep us from going where we want to go. This guy says, no, no, I'm in a dark place here. I'm in a dangerous environment. I could get hurt. I could fall over stuff. I could run into stuff. Your word turns on the light. And I can see the path, and I can see my feet, and I can see where I'm going. This, folks, is the objective of the law of God, to show you the way in a dark place. It's like a carbide lamp on a miner's cap. Without it, you're in a whole lot of trouble. With it, you can find your way out. He said, in verse 121, I have done judgment and justice. Don't leave me to my oppressors. Be surety for your servant for good, and don't let the proud oppress me. My eyes fail for your salvation and for the word of your righteousness. Deal with me according to your mercy. Teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for you, O Lord, to work, for they have made void your law. Fools have come along and said, Oh, the law of God's all been abolished. You don't have to pay any attention to it anymore. That's his response. He, he could see this coming way back there. And here we sit in the latter days, and they've told us that the law of God's been voided. Why? Why would you want to get rid of something this valuable? Therefore, he said, I love your commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. So I esteem all your precepts concerning everything to be right, and I hate every false way. Now, can you see why the psalmist would think we are crazy as bedbugs for wanting to abandon the law? When it gives you this long sequence of freedom, liberty, understanding, knowledge, wisdom, and, and, and helps you to have a system, a basis of knowledge for making a life's difficult ethical decisions, when you've got this tremendous resource here, why on earth do you want to give it up? Well, he didn't want to give it up and couldn't see why anybody else would. He says in verse 129, Therefore your testimonies are wonderful. So my soul keeps them. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. It's a head-slapping experience. Oh, I see. I opened my mouth. I panted. I longed for your commandments. Look at me. Be merciful to me as you used to do to those that love your name. Order my steps in the word. And don't let any iniquity have any dominion over me. The objective of the law is to keep you free so that sin, iniquity, can't enslave you. I cried, verse 145, with my whole heart. Hear me, Lord. I will keep your statutes. I cried unto you, save me. I'll keep your testimonies. I prevented the dawning of the morning, and I cried, I hoped in your word. My eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in your word. Guys, up all night on this. Now listen. If someone gave you a complicated, 
but infallible means of beating the stock market, would you stay up late at night to learn it? You know, would you burn the midnight oil? Would you sit at your computer all through the night in the night watches and try your best to master this particular system of investing in the stock market? Well, shucks, people spend all night looking for systems to invest in the stock market that aren't infallible. So you know what they'd do if they had one that they'd, somebody assured them it really would work? You know, I could give you this. It's, but it is going to require work. It's going to have you staying up all night at the computer, running different programs, trying to sort out things, searching and finding exactly the right stuff. A lot of hard work. Would you do it? Many people would because they realize the enormous value something like that could mean to them. The truth is that the law of God is the secret to mastering life, not the market. The market is another matter altogether. The law of God is the secret to mastering life. This life, not salvation, not the next life, this life is what it's all about. The law is not to give salvation. It is not to gain eternal life. It is to master this life that we're living right now. He goes on to say in verse 160, Your word is true from the beginning, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. What can I tell you? And then along comes Jesus and said, Hey, don't think I've come to destroy the law. I haven't come to destroy the law. I've come to fill it up. Not one jot, not one tittle, which betrays that Jesus was talking about the written law, not the oral law. Not one jot, not one tittle shall pass from the law till heaven and earth pass, until everything has come to be. So, just how temporary is the law, both by the psalmist and the testimony of Jesus. Now, as we said this morning, this presents us with enormous problems, depending upon the approach to the law we take. He goes on to say, Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. I rejoice at your word as one that finds great spoil. And why wouldn't he? He's found the secret of life. It's just not a simple secret. It's just not a key in a lock. It requires work, but it's a way. He says, I hate, I abhor lying. Well, I have every reason to hate it, because lying is one of the most destructive things. It distorts and perverts the mind. But, but your law I love. Seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous judgment. Great peace have all they that love your law, and nothing shall offend them. The objective of the law is peace. And, in the end, the objective of the law is also Jesus Christ. Finally, in 174, he says, I have longed for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise you, and let your judgments help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, because I am not going to forget your commandments. Marvelous song. And it's very hard, having read this, to cope with this idea that there's something bad about the Old Testament law that God would need to come along and get rid of it. Now, whenever the law enters a theological discussion, it immediately divides the discussion into two channels. And it had done so, long, long since done so, in the days of Jesus. It already was there. And it's long since done so in Christian theology as well. The one channel is legalism. Now, technically, in the dictionary, legalism denotes the teaching of salvation by works of law. But it connotes much more than that as well. It encompasses the efforts of religious teachers to use the law as a means of controlling a population, which has been done from time immemorial by cult leaders and religious leaders of one kind or another. Legalism spawns endless debates over the writings of Paul and the teachings of Jesus in various strained interpretations of proof texts on both sides of that issue. The other channel, apart from legalism, is grace. But grace is in no way opposed to law. In fact, and this may come as a surprise to some, the giving of the law was the greatest act of grace. That it was the graciousness of God who kindly revealed to man his law so that man might have all those things that the man who wrote the 119th Psalm listed. Understanding, knowledge, wisdom, judgment, more wisdom than all of his teachers. That God's grace gave us the law 
so that we would do that. The law is not given to control. The law is given to teach. You do know, don't you, that the word Torah, which is the word normally translated law in the Old Testament, means teaching. When you read it this way, in fact, when you read it this way in the New Testament, the whole meaning of these things changes. And in Judaism, the uh, the full understanding is that the law is teaching and the word Talmud is learning. The written law is teaching. The oral law is all about learning. And that's where the difference between the two is best defined. I want to give you two great examples of grace. I said in conclusion a minute ago, but I'm in conclusion of the 119th Psalm. Sorry to get your hopes up. Two great examples of grace. One of them is in Matthew 12, verse 1. Jesus and his disciples went through the corn on the Sabbath day. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck the ears of the corn and to eat them. Ah, they broke the law, because you weren't supposed to do this. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. Now, Jesus doesn't say back to them, which he might not lawful according to who. Because it wasn't, there's no law in the Old Testament that says you can't grab a handful of grain on the Sabbath day off a stalk and eat it any more than a fig off a tree. He went on, though, to say to them, Haven't you read what David did when he was hungry and they that were with him? Listen carefully to this example. How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them that were with him, but only for the priests. Now, it's obvious that what Jesus is trying to say here is that David was not condemned for this. You know, there was no condemnation that came upon him. He did not, however, say that the law wasn't in fact. He didn't say the law was voided by what David did. What David did was an exception covered by grace, that God's gracious. God's not a nitpicker. God's not standing around the corner waiting for you to make a mistake so he can hit you for it. That in this situation... The men sat there, they tried to make the best decision they could in good faith, they went ahead and ate the showbread based upon the discussion they had. And Jesus seems to say, it wasn't a big deal. He said, and haven't you read in the law how that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Why? Well, because the Sabbath says you're not to do any work. But on the other hand, the priestly law says you've got to, you've got to kill and butcher and burn and all sorts of these animals, and that's more work than catching a handful of grain on the Sabbath day. But they have to do it. Now, it's not hard to understand that if two laws come into conflict, the greater law should take precedence over the lesser law, is it? But I'll give you, I almost guarantee that almost everyone would assume that the Ten Commandments are the greater law than the ceremonial law. And yet, in the temple, the ceremonial law took precedence over the Sabbath day. What can I tell you? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. If you had known what this means... I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Notice that God is bigger than the Sabbath. Jesus is bigger than the Sabbath. And it's something which sometimes gets lost from people. Now, there's a fallacious argument about grace. It argues that grace has somehow made the law void. In this case, grace did not it allowed for an exception to the law not avoiding of the law. Now, the second illustration I want to give you. You're probably familiar with a statement that Paul made back in Galatians. It's one verse. You don't need to turn to it. Chapter 3, verse 19. Wherefore then serves the law, Paul says. It was added because of transgressions until the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hands of a mediator. Now, here is an illustration of this law and an illustration of grace. It's found in the 24th chapter of Deuteronomy And it begins in verse verse, verse 1. I won't even go back and read it to you. We're running a little short on time. But I want you to understand the principle that's involved here. In this particular chapter, it says, If a man is married a wife and he finds no favor with her because there is in her some matter of uncleanness, and that's a euphemism for some sexual uncleanness in the woman, he is to give her a writing of divorcement and put her away. And when she is put away, she cannot marry another man. Now, when they asked Jesus about this in the New Testament, you know, why did Moses do this when you're suggesting that that should, you know, should be one man, one woman for life, and that you can't put your wife away? Jesus' answer was, Moses indeed permitted you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. What he is saying is that from the beginning it was God's intent that made one man, one woman for life. 
However, when sin has entered the picture, grace must enter the picture as well. And the law given in the book of Deuteronomy, the 24th chapter, verse 1 and the following, is the grace of God allowing for people to work out the problem when sin has entered into the picture and has destroyed the marriage. And if you carefully read Jesus' response to all this in, in, in Matthew, he turns around and accepts what Moses said in his discussion. But he also says it wasn't that way in the beginning. These some laws were added because of transgressions. Now, as I said before, not every law finds application in Western law, in Western circumstances. There are many places in the Old Testament you'll read along, you'll find a law, and you'll throw up your hands and say, I have no idea what to do about this. It has no application, but it still sits there in your Bible, and it is still the testimony of God. It's the testimony of God about what to do under these circumstances, in this time, and in this place. And each of us has an obligation to learn from that, to read it, to study it, to think, to apply, because the law is not shackles. The law is not chains. It is not a yoke of bondage. It is a light to your feet, a lamp to your path. 